Welcome to the Milestones Motivation and Money Podcast, hosted by Angel Radcliffe. Tune in as we discuss finances, success stories, and inspiring vibes that will help nurture growth. Welcome back to the podcast. On today's show, we're chatting with Sean Harper, who is a motivational speaker, author, and former NFLer. Sean is the author of The Winning Edge, Eight Principles That Will Bring Out the Winner in You. And today's episode, we're discussing creating winning teams. So this is a critical topic, whether you're in corporate America or if you're a business owner, and really how you can leverage someone's strong points and weak points. So tune in. Sean, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. And thanks for having me. And let's have fun and let's win today. I know. I'm so excited to have this conversation on creating winning teams because I think so many leaders and business owners would like to know how to do that. So it's an interesting topic, especially within the last 18 months. And when we're looking at the economy, when we see people actually backing out of the workforce and right now it's a job seekers market and so many people are having this issue of like creating their team and having that, that winning team. So we'll dive into that. But first, I want our listeners to really understand who you are and get a sense of who they're getting this insight from today. So how about you just tell us a little bit more about yourself? Awesome. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to have a chance to invest in the world's greatest resource, which is people. Investing in people has the potential of reaping generations of dividends. That's just not a cliche-ish type of an actual intro, but to pour yourself into people in the midst of, of, a, of a myopic world is just one of the key foundations of success. So I played seven years professional football. I played with the Rams. I played with the Colts. I played with Indianapolis Colts. I played over in NFL Europe, had success there. And I took that success. I parlayed it into business. I've been in business for over 20 years. Uh, I own and operate a security firm plus another consulting firm on the side. Marrying the tactics and the strategies of playing professional football, but the story. You always hear the, you know, the old saying, that's the glory, but the story. The story is that I came from almost an impossible environment to win. That was doc- I was documented with four to five learning disabilities, graduated last in my class in academics, 1.62 accumulative GPA, not on my ACT, repeated the first grade impoverished. I mean, not poor, but po, po. My mom raised all six of us by herself, voted most likely to fail. I haven't already mentioned that. And that's just the edited version. I haven't gotten into, you know, all of the, you know, struggles with law enforcement, but just to make that long story short is that there was no way that I would be successful, but I did find a way to win. And that was the paradigm that changed my life. Oh, wow. And so two things, you played in the NFL and you own a security firm. So I want to come back to the security firm. So let's talk about the NFL because that had to be an amazing experience. So what teams did you play for? So the Rams and the Colts, Houston, where they were in Houston for a short stint before they went to Tennessee. And then I played in NFL Europe for Frankfurt and Amsterdam as well. And so I had an absolutely amazing experience with some amazing athletes, but more importantly, understanding business from a different perspective and working in the perfection of high level functioning teams. So coming out of that, how did you go from the mindset of athlete to now motivational speaker, entrepreneur? What was the drive behind that? Right. Well, that was centered around the word win. And kind of digressing back to my story when I had that conversation that Sean, there's no way you could be successful. You don't have the education. Uh, You don't have an effective lifestyle. Uh, You don't have the right connections. Everything that you can probably mention that was stacked against me athletically, I was horrible. I was horrific in athletics. I I wasn't honorable mention all conference. So I didn't have that. There was nothing there. But I said that, but then something deep within me said, you can win though. And once I made the paradigm, which all profit is, is birthed in paradigms. Once I've made that paradigm, like I'm in this game to win. I'm in life's game, not to be successful, which is a man-made construct. I'm in life's game to win. Once that happened, everything that was put in me to win came to life. And so I went from 
you know, 1.62 to a double major graduate from the IU Bloomington Postgrad Studies, not barely starting in high school football to seven years professional football, stuttering my entire life to a corporate and international motivational speaker. And so my paraphrase or my phrase is, if life is a game, play to win. But that winning mindset is nestled in your self-concept. Who are you, victim or victor? My self-concept, the the crux or the basis of who I am is that I'm a winner. So because of that, I will seek out winning opportunities and I will manifest winning things. And that's how I was able to take that mindset of being a winner into corporate America and everyone else has their projections and their success model. I had a winning model. And that winning model was able to see things differently and target opportunities and recognize opportunities where other people saw adversity. And I was able to carve myself in niches. And that's how I've been doing it for over 20 years. Having a winning model. That's so interesting. And I, and I actually wrote that down. I want to come back to that. When you talk about motivating people and really empowering people who are um, in these companies and all walks of life, mm-hmm. let's hone in on the winning aspect. What makes a winner? Well, everyone listening to me, this is kind of controversial, but that's okay. Everyone listening to me right now, you are a winner. A winner is something that's not made. It's who you are. So I'll work and I'll explain this and I'm going to do it from the macro to the micro. This is why people love sports. Now think about this for a second. You may have a favorite professional football team, basketball team, baseball team, but if that team loses every single game for the next 10 years, you will not be caught dead in that Jersey unless you're a Cleveland Browns fan and you know, they, they don't care. Right. So, but if they win every single game, you'll dig underneath the house or underneath the drawer and you'll pull up that Jersey or that hat and you'll wear it proudly. Why? Because although you love that team, your DNA can only identify with winners. Now, that same concept now makes gambling a multi-billion dollar industry. I'm always flying into Vegas, get off the plane, slot machines. And these people aren't trying to be successful. They're trying to win. Gaming, video games, multi-billion dollar industry. So I'm I'm working. I'm actually uh, working deductively. So now I'm going back to the point that every single one of us, you are one to two to three million sperm cells. You are the sperm cell that made it to fertilize the egg. You are running for your life or for your life, literally. Now you are born and the fact that you've made it and are born, which means that you are a winner. So you attach the fact that you are a winner to your birth. And that is who I am. So that negates your failure. That negates your stupid. That negates you're not like your brothers or sisters. That negates the fact that you're an underperformer. No, I'm a winner. So now since I'm a winner, I do winning things. And so I affirm my subconscious by doing winning things. So that separated me from the success model that we're taught when we're in the third and fourth grade that we have to live in a certain subdivision and, you know, make, you know, six, seven figure income and, you know, drive a Maserati, the second car is a Maserati and, and blah, 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 blah. You know, that's all image based. God didn't call your image. God called your identity and the winner is in the identity. Those are great, great words, but I do have one question. Go for it. (laughs) It was a Monterey out when you were in fourth grade. <laughs> no. Well, I'm, I'm talking kidding. about when I was in I'm LA, in Malibu. <laughs> no, I was like, how old is Maserati? Like, when did they come out with it? No, but been no, out for no, a while. no, no. I know it's just a figure of speech. So, <laughs> so, you know, when we get into like creating these winning teams, what should leaders or business owners be looking for in a in an individual? Yeah, so that was my biggest struggle is coming from playing professional football to going into corporate. And this is why, because for the most part, professional sports, the goal is defined and people typically have one or two, basically the same temperament. You know, everyone, you know, there are four different temperaments. Some people call them personalities. That's not true. They're temperaments. Yeah. One of four temperaments. And so most athletes are what they call a D on the disc, you know, a lion or some tests and, I don't know which one it is on Myers-Briggs, but it's like they're very forward thinking, they're drivers, they're aggressive, they're assertive, and they love to win. They attract that since they've been in, in middle school, high school, right? And so being around these individuals is easy. When I went to corporate America, when I opened up my company, I noticed people didn't have the same temperament 
that I had. And they were like, you know, let's talk about it. You know, let's be efficient and, you know, let's, you know, let's go through practices. And I'm like, I ain't got time for that. Show me the profit. And I failed miserably. And so I started understanding and learning people, learning their temperament, learning what makes them tick, under, n- knowing more about people than you do yourself, reading books. I'll give you one right now. How to Win Friends and Influence People by Mr. Carnegie. Understanding people, understanding their temperaments, understanding their why, and understanding their win. Now, that required me to be extremely unselfish. And that's what I was able to do. And that's the secret sauce is understanding, motivating, and encouraging people. So Sean, thank you so much for that insight. So one of the things that I want to hone in on is, you know, leaders and business owners are looking to create these winning teams. You just gave insights as to what they should look for in the individual, but we have to keep it real here because everyone really doesn't have all of these strong points that would go into this sort of winning mindset. So what are some tips for leaders and business owners and how they can really play on someone's strong points, but also play off of a person's weak points? One of the things that I would do, I'm just going to walk you through step by step. Okay. First, you got to look at your, your actual objective. What is your objective? Okay. Is your objective clear enough? Okay, let's get some clarity in your goals. Let's get some clarity in your mission statement. Where are you going? Okay, this is where you're going. See, playing football was easy. We're going to the Super Bowl. That's our objective. In corporate America, it can be kind of, you know, mixed or marred a little bit. This is where we're going. What do you need to get there? It's the next question. Now, who do you need to man that area to get there? If you if you want... Uh, a weird example. Well, it's not weird, but it's different. Hey, I need someone driving sales. That's huge. Sales, it, it's at, at, in, in some aspects, is the lifeblood of your company or your organization. Well, you need the temperament of a person that is excitable. They love to engage. They love to talk and they're confident. And, and that, that certain temperament, you put them in that area. The temperament that you don't put in that position is somebody who does not like rejection, who does not like confrontation, who is very soft-spoken. They may have a soft handshake. That is not weakness because that temperament is usually the most loyal person in the entire company. That person right there will stay with you and everyone else will leave. So you put that person in the care of people. So you recognize and you value everyone for their strength and weaknesses. And guess what? No one has air all the pieces to the puzzle. I am probably, true confession, I am probably one of the most dis- or disorganized people on the planet. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know many people that are more disorganized than me. But guess what? I'm not disabled. I'm uniquely enabled. So I have two assistants. I have someone who's doing this and someone who's doing that and someone who's driving me and keeping me on task, but they're not as creative as me. They're not as driven as me. They're not up at three or four o'clock in the morning scheming on how to open up other companies and take over the world. They don't have that, you know, they're in bed, right? So you find your strengths and you find your weaknesses and you find people to complement that. We all focus on Bill Gates, but who was Paul Allen? No one talks about Paul Allen. We talk about Mick Jagger, but who is Keith Richards? The lead guitar player right next to him. We talk about George Clinton, but who is Maceo Parker? And so there's teams everywhere you go. Mark Zuckerberg, yeah, he had like nine or 10 of the founders. We don't talk about them. So everywhere you go, whenever you see wins, there's always a team. We, in our Western society, we always tend to focus on the lead individual, but that support staff is critical. And it's usually the weakness of the leader. So in a sense, are you saying that leaders should meet people where they are and sort of work with what they have? Appreciate people where they are. Look past what's not there and look what they bring to the table. Well, first, honestly, you have to attract, you have to be intentional and to build that, to find, okay, you fit kind of the mode of what I'm looking for. Now, what is your secret sauce? What is your win? Not so much of what is your why. That's what drives you. What is your win? What are you trying to do? Okay, you have great organizational skills. Okay, you have great organizational skills. Great. 
well, let's put you in this arena because this is where you're going to win at. Weaknesses, if you're good enough and you're on my team, I'm going to staff your weaknesses. I'm going to put somebody right next to you that's creative and outgoing because you don't have that. And I, you're not going to waste your energy trying to get that because you'll never get it because that's not how that's not what God created in you. So you build your team like a jigsaw puzzle, your strengths. And my job as a leader is to keep you looking at your strengths and to bring people alongside you to complement your weaknesses, because now we don't compete, we complete. And that we've learned since we were kids watching superheroes. You've never heard a superhero complain about his or her weaknesses. They just say, hey, I can't fly. That's all right. Wonder Woman has a plane, bro. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially what you're saying is you're using one person's strength to complement that other team member's weakness, not really going in this process of elimination. Because when we think about business owners and, and also as a leader in corporate, I've worked with several people throughout the years who just did not catch on. And, you know, when you have deadlines to meet and, and work to get done. You're like, I need another resource or someone has to come in because the team is suffering. It's like, you know, at, at some point there's some give and take, but your strategy is a bit different. It's not one that I've necessarily heard before. Of course, if you're in a corporate environment, if someone's not working out, essentially they end up losing their job, they're demoted they're moved to another department. They're right. not Right. chosen for you know wh whatever particular project no one wants that person on their team now it, there are people who have this leadership mindset it's like you know let me grow and upskill this person but to what extent do you continue yes. to do that if that person is not catching on so so what i hear and what i'm hearing is 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 it's it's going to lay the groundwork for clarification okay you have your core. So what I've learned and what I've noticed in corporate America is that, you know, we hire or they hire because I'm not a corporate guy. I have about hundred employees, but I'm, I'm still not that corporate level. They hire, they love credentials. They hire, they hire off of, you know, I, 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 when I went to MIT, did this, 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 and this, and they can, great. Yeah, great. You're hired resume. Oh, wow. You're hired. Mm -mm. You got to look deeper. You got to look at the core of the person. Okay. And for the lack of a better phrase, I look for the ride or die. I look for someone's like, you know what? I'm in it to win it. I just hired a guy two days ago. I know he doesn't have, he's, he's in his early fifties. And I know he doesn't have the technical and the computer savvy. He doesn't have it. But I said to HR today, I said, this guy, will use his verbal judo and he's going to get out there and he's going to make stuff happen. He's going to work because he wants to overcompensate because he knows he doesn't have the technical skills to win. But so he's going to overcompensate in people, personalities, temperaments, and he's going to win that way. Guess what? We're going to put somebody in the office to help him out because that person's a winner. Now, if you're not a winner and you're a whiner, Oh, you got to go. I will sniff you out within two weeks. You're out of here. You got to go. If you are a person who likes to create mischief and strife, you're out of here because you can't prosper in a stressful, strife-filled environment. And I've learned that by playing professional football. There were players, great athletes, but they always stored up the, the uh, actual harness nest. They always cost uh, gossip and, and, and just strife in the locker room. Those players were blackballed and the NFL were blackballed. There's only one, just only two teams that will hire a player once he has been blackballed. That's the Raiders and the Cowboys. So if you ever see crazy, unusual players going to the Cowboys, you, you understand Jerry Jones is his own man and he does things a little different, but they will blackball you because you're not good for business. That is, uh, I don't want to say that that's true, but uh, I have some, <laughs> I can tell you, I have some, some of my mom's friends who sort of believe in that whole corporate blackballing process. And oh. I mean, that can, we can go in a whole rabbit hole conversation about it. I'm like, eh, you know, I think it, it depends on where you are. If you're in a small town, there's not a lot of resources, not a lot of companies and yeah, where it gets around and well, it depends. 
And if you're, and if you are, I guess, content on staying in one particular industry, if that indus- industry is small, it's a possibility. Well, so, so, so I don't, I, you know, as a business owner, I need to know if you're toxic because you can have all the credentials. I mean, that's, you know, that's awesome. But if you're toxic, you will pollute and pervert my culture and the culture. And that's a whole new different episode or topic. The culture is like the secret to any thriving organization. Talent is a seed, but the soil, which is the culture is everything. And if I have a person messing up the pH in my culture, then that that phone's going to stop ringing. Opportunities are going to close out of nowhere because opportunities, wealth, winning follows amazing cultures and so i have to get you out of here no matter how good you are that's a good point that is a good point especially when you're running a business and really like keeping keeping the culture uh intact so you you said something that resonated and i was actually uh taking note over here is in companies most companies are sort of looking at credentials and not necessarily like those soft or hard skills or and it made me think of a conversation i just had the other day i was like we have so many people in this world who are quote unquote book smart but they lack common sense and <laughs> how do you view this this whole a degree is needed to succeed in this world it's not are you kidding me it's like i mean this is one of, wow, this is probably one of the biggest scams ever is that we push people towards college degrees. I mean, there's a certain temperament that loves credentials, right? Like I really struggle when I speak in front of certain like academia because they don't see letters after my name. But let me tell you something, that's a scam. That is a scam. And there are certain, there are certain degrees that you need. If you want to be a doctor, I understand that. You want to be a lawyer, learn some Latin, I I understand that. But to push everyone to college or towards college is a scam. And it's a big scam. The federal government's making a lot of money. The student loan people are making a lot of money. That's probably one of the only loans you cannot get out of. Think about this for a second. You can get a loan easy, student loan, but bankruptcy can't get rid of it. Nothing can get rid of a student loan debt. Not it's it's horrible, and people are be paying that. People are paying that for the rest of your life. Think of some of the most successful people. How much college did Bill Gates have? He dropped out. Mark Zuckerberg. He dropped out. I have a list of people. In fact, a guy who went to my alma mater is the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks. He dropped out. Cuban dropped out. Of, of Indiana University. Now you make a really good point. <laughs> and I've been studying that for years as well. And so I always like to know other people's opinions on that. But but it really gets me into the next question is, you know, you have a business as well. So you have the security firm. So tell us more about the company that you own. American Services and Protection. Uh, we have unarmed and armed security officers located in Columbus, Ohio. We're up to about, uh, we're right at the 100 officer mark. Uh, we've been in business since 2000. And I was partners with another company in July 2004. I just jumped in full go and I just took American services with the help of God, of course. I, I, I have to say that I'm not ashamed of that. And we've been running for, you know, years. And it's been a blessing. It's been a challenge. We've learned a lot, but I love protecting. I love blessing. You know, I was an offensive lineman. So every client is my quarterback and my job is to protect the quarterback. So that's, you know, even in this pandemic and it, you know, if I could just jump off just real quick and just have a, you know, you know, a glorious ADD moment, it, it, it's, it's, there is a lot of pressure out there. The elephant in the room, no one is talking about is entrepreneurs and business owners and C-suite people dealing with the pressure of the adversity that's in our culture right now. And I just want to encourage everyone, instead of looking out, because there's no playbook for this. We haven't had a pandemic since 1918. We're 100 years due. There's no literature. There's no pandemic. There's no case study for this one, okay? You're not going to bring in a consultant to show you. So stop looking out 
And now you got to look in. You got to look in and you got to dig in deep. It will break. You will see the opportunity and you will win. Take care of your mind. Take care of your body. Take care of the people around you. And let's ride this thing out. Those are really good, inspiring words. So I want to go back to, to your security business because I are you providing equipment? Is it bodyguard? Oh. I'm sorry. That was the motivator in me kind of just like this went somewhere. No, no, you're fine. Yeah. So yeah, we have unarmed and armed security officers primarily. We do sell and resell security products, not as much as we used to. And we are licensed in the state of Ohio. We do have a federal certifications as well. And yeah, that's what we do. We do mainly corporate clients, high rise buildings. I typically do not provide security with any installation that serves alcohol or no high risk environment because I don't want that phone call saying, Hey, your, your officer was involved in a potential, you know, altercation or things like that. So I just elected not to take the business. So Sean, take me back to before starting the business, even before the partnership, when did you first learn about entrepreneurship? Wow, it's amazing. That, you know, that is a great question. That's a great question, by the way. My brother was an entrepreneur. My mom actually raised us to be entrepreneurs. My mom scrubbed floors for a living. She scrubbed floors for very affluent and wealthy people. And she would listen to the conversations. And sometimes they would teach her. And she watched, and then she would come home, and then she would teach us. She would I- explain what the individuals were doing, what was their next move? What was the meeting about? I mean, high level stuff. And she would just, this is how you do it. You know, this is how you get your land. This is how you get your gold. This is, this is how you prepare. And in a sense, she was an entrepreneur being a maid. And that just stuck with us, stuck with all the Harpers. So when you were really getting ready to walk into this business venture, did you know everything you needed to do as far as legitimizing a business and nothing. contracts and nothing? I knew absolutely nothing. Who was more I, so your go-to person at that point? It, it, I probably knew about 10 to 15 percent of what I needed to know. And I it was trial by fire from day one. But I'm gonna share something with you that helped me in this is that. Although I didn't know, you know, the strategic plans and a good CPA and, and, you know, the things that they teach you in the SBA handbook, right? But I knew spiritual laws. My mom taught me that. And so I would spend a lot of time investing in forgiving and giving money and, and, and just being a blessing. And I promise you that carried me for an extremely long time. And that's a, totally different, you know, off the, you know, but it doesn't come to you if it can't get through you. And so I was, you know, I've learned how to be a a big time giver. And, and I sowed a lot of seed to bless people throughout those years until my head knowledge caught up. And then I started, you know, with teams hiring people that was just absolutely smarter than me. I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, I was also taught, you know, you spend your money on certain things. I found the best CPA. I found the best lawyers. And I paid them. I said, now you go out, you handle it, you fight, you look at contracts and tell me what you see so you can teach me a little bit too. My team is always smarter than me. Sometimes they are. That's, you know, we can have a whole conversation about teams. That's something that I've been working on building for a while now. And it's, it's interesting to really see people's personalities and dynamics and really how they fit into the, something that you're trying to build. So Sean, I, I definitely appreciate those insights. I know we're nearing the end of the show, so I want to get into more of of a financial question. And so this is a question I ask all of my guests who come on the show. I would love to understand your definition of balling on a budget or balling on a budget. Yeah, (laughs) balling on on a budget. Well, I tell you what, I know this is going to be so con contrary that a lot of people think but winners don't think that way because winners will get dirty 
They'll get the jersey dirty. They'll get everything. You know, it's not about looking good. And it's not about getting or making it to the next level, living on that level. That's a trap. Some of the richest people I know, are, I'm talking eight figures. I'm talking, I know a guy who's almost worth a billion dollars. You would never, he has a Ford F-150. He has a dirty t-shirt and he's sitting there counting, looking at receipts. When, there's a guy in Chicago I went to go speak for. I call him Uncle Lou. He was arguing with the hotel manager, arguing because $20 on a hotel bill. And it was just absolutely crazy. I mean, Lou, I'm like, dude, you're worth like $30 million. Why are you arguing over 20 bucks on a hotel bill? And he, it's just absolutely amazing. So my, my goal, my dream, and this is going to sound weird, but I know a lot of wealthy people. My dream is to be frugal, is to be the least unassuming person in the room to win in the end for my family and for my son. And for my wife, which is my queen. That's my goal. That's my dream. Love it. Love it. And do you have any last words for our listeners today? Yeah, I, I do. I do. Learn failure is your friend. Failure is your friend. The average millionaire has filed for bankruptcy 3.2 times, according to Google. Failure is your friend. Learn from it, get back up. And when you get knocked down, if you can look up, you can get up. And as you, Helping them as a coach, that's the most important part of that aspect of your team. Build it and win with it. Thanks for listening. Stay connected with Angel online on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Miss RMBA. That's M-I-S-S-R-M-B-A. Be sure to subscribe and review. Join us next time as we continue to empower you through milestones, motivation, and money.